conference and members meeting organized by ARSS group conference in association with IRAJ, ACN, SARC, and uh, IASTM, Warfare, Science Globe, and uh, IFERP, ASAR, AEEE Forum, and all. So, I. Ravi Kumar, organizing committee, uh, organizing secretary. So, ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce our uh, non profit organization is to bridge gap between uh, students, professors, academicians, industrialists from various multidisciplinary. So, apart from organizing various uh, seminars, expert talks, and conferences, we have various highly rated multidisciplinary journals in the field of science engineering, technology, and management. So since our inception, we have been organizing various international conferences at various places like India, New York, London, Australia, right, Hong Kong, Dubai, Bangkok, Kuala Lumpur, etc. More than 1 lakh people across the globe are associated with us, and uh, more than 50,000 plus uh, publications has been done uh, from our organizations. So this is a just brief about our organization, right? So with this, I would welcome wholeheartedly everyone. And then we will quickly go ahead and start with the conference by not wasting much time. So well, uh, to introduce myself, I'm Professor Ravi Kumar. I am uh, the, I'm a part of uh, organizing secretary with here with this conference. And I'm also an academician uh, with the industrialist knowledge uh, and have like more textbooks, patents, uh, and publications in my name. So this is a small brief about me. All right. Uh, let us now quickly go ahead and start with the conference. I call upon D. Sundar Reddy. Is the presentation clear, sir? Yes, it is clear. Thank you so much, sir. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon to all the esteemed members present, uh, online and offline. And this is my paper presentation. Inclusive leadership practices and their role in improving innovative work behavior among staff in higher education institutions. I, along with my other two co authors, Dr. Martin Arani and Esther Ratna, are happy to present this paper. As an introduction, uh, inclusive environment is a sense of belonging and security from the team. We feel that we are part of decision making and involve ourselves in the creative work for the institution. This is based on the principles of democracy and justice to encourage subordinates to work and coordinate. Leadership can be judged from the interaction between leaders and employees and hence inclusive leadership is open, effective and accessible in the process of communication with employees. This is mainly related to inclusion practices in the workplace in order to change and create an inclusive environment in group where leaders can satisfy employees need for belongingness and uniqueness resulting in innovation. A brief review of literature, I'll just run through. Plessa and Mark 2014 studied the concept of inclusion competencies, which means specify specific quality and trait that enable individuals to effectively respond to challenges and opportunities in a diverse and inclusionary work environment. Nishil 2009 says it's, it is this relational leadership that interacts with leaders and employees and is responsible for the final outcome. Nishil 2013 observed it is an inclusive and uh, climate of high degree there is a low level of relationship conflict without much conflict among the employees and employers, even between gender, which fosters comprehensive thinking on broader issues using broader participation and involvement of all subordinates. Inclusive leadership is also an embodiment of openness and fairness be, bring success to the organization. And not only that, they treat employee with recognition, respect and tolerance. This is a brief uh, literature review, uh, which tells us that this uh, inclusive environment is not a new concept, but it has been in practice and work. 
the objectives that we are referring to are i am going to have three objectives to study inclusive leadership practices and innovative practices of higher education institutions second objective of the study is to describe the importance of inclusive leadership fundamentals on innovative work behavior among faculty members of higher education institutions third objective would be to explore the significant relationship between the demographic fundamentals and among the fundamentals of inclusive leadership in higher education institutions these are the three objectives based on which this paper is worked upon and the research design is this i have used exploratory study to explore the significant relationship between demographics and the fundamentals of inclusive leadership in higher education institutions using statistical hypothesis testing with the help of anova test descriptive research design is applied to conceptualize the role of innovative work behavior needed for the staff to perform efficiently sampling method is non random sampling method is used and primary data is collected through questionnaires to the institutional to the people who are working in the institutions research hypothesis i have come out with three hypotheses the null hypothesis number 1 is there exists no significant difference between the perceptions of male and female respondents so the first null hypothesis uh, studies the different uh, perceptions of male and female with regard to fundamentals of inclusive leadership null hypothesis 2 studies based on the total experience in teaching towards the fundamentals of inclusive leadership the respondents total experience is taken into consideration and the null hypothesis third is taken the response of the respondents of the experience in the same institution which they are working currently these three null hypotheses are taken into consideration for further uh, data collection and also working so inclusive leadership purpose i have taken a uh, popular model of the linkage inclusive leadership assessment model by charlie marrow vice president there are three parts in this leading self leading relationships and leading culture under leading self we have courageous authentic and open value perspectives under leading relationships we have communications adaptively uh, builds and concepts relationships facilitates development under leading culture builds a climate of trust and respect shares authority power and credit allows for differences this is how the inclusive environment builds leaders and also the employees as together the institution we have a few uh, methods and then uh, people talking about innovation which is uh, because of the uh, inclusive environment in this competitive environment of globalization and rapid technology innovation is being regarded as the fundamental element for the growth and performance of the organization to identify fundamentals that can simulate employee innovative behavior which refer to employees engaging initiatives the approach of inclusive leadership provides innovative environments unlike the traditional leader centric approach in which the focus is on the leader's attitude and behavior while assuming the followers characteristics to be homogeneous inclusive leadership turned out to be a predictor of job autonomy and innovative behavior and uh, inclusive leadership leaders with inclusive style initiate a quality relationship which can promote fairness of input and output to all employees without relying on one's abilities there is a misconception about innovation that in inclusive environment may not lead to we are not talking about great innovations but innovation process employees use their competencies and come out with a demonstrated discretionary behavior where they created promoted and implemented novel ideas this in turn will shape the innovative work behavior which we are talking about it is the initiation presentation and realization of new ideas products and procedures in the working place which give rise to innovative work behavior and findings that we come about before we go to findings 
the role of inclusive leadership on innovation capability in higher education institutions we have a, a few things which those are interested in putting inclusive leadership into practice like uh, leadership as an equitable collective process rather than in terms of individuals include staff students parents in all institutional processes advocate for inclusion and for excluded individ individuals and groups educate the entire institution community develop critical consciousness in the institute community promote brainstorming and nominal techniques emphasize student learning through their problem solving methods adopt inclusive decision and policy making processes an inclusive leader strives to combine his leadership style with his personal values because he normally characterized by his personal values we have four four uh, points in innovative work behavior that is opportunity exploration innovation problem recognition one point and then idea generation where generating novel and useful ideas and idea promotion third one seeking ideas among colleagues for funding and facilitation idea realization the creation and implementation of prototype or model in the working group organization some through data analysis and interpretation so for data analysis for the null hypothesis one the statistical t test for independent sampling is used and for the null hypothesis 2 and 3 anova one way classification is used with the null hypothesis one there exists significant difference between the male and female respondents towards the statement one of the factor leading self and the statements one and three of the factor leading relationships female faculty members are more positive than male faculty members with regard to null hypothesis two there exist significant difference again between the perceptions of faculty members towards the fundamentals based on their total experience experienced faculty with 10 and above are more positive with regard to null hypothesis 3 there exists no different significant difference between perception of faculty members towards the statement 3 of inclusive leadership factor leading relationships uh, as part of conclusion as can be seen from the above results it is found that gender differences exist between male and male faculty members and fe female faculty members with respect to the courageous nature expressive nature of leaders and facilitating development in higher education institutions where female faculty members are positive about it but it is also found that the faculty members with experience of 10 and above are positive about the inclusiveness and innovation in the higher education institutions whereas the new faculty members perceptions are just the opposite under the third category of study on the differences in the opinion of faculty members based on their experience in the present institution it is found that the new faculty members are positive except in the building relationship factor of leading relationship compared to the experienced ones hence the leaders in the higher education institutions need to have a common policy on inclusiveness without any discrimination and differences and the staff should be given more opportunities to put forth their ideas for adoption and the leaders should evaluate their ideas before adoption and finally institution should be inclusive and be innovative and make the role of inclusiveness significant in order to attract innovative work behavior thank you and, and uh, over to the organizers thank you thank you sir it is for your wonderful presentation nice uh, topic actually so we'll be in touch please do share your email address and contact details out there in the email so people who have any questionaries request you to connect uh, sundar reddy uh, over the chat box thank you now i would like to call upon uh, asif so you are ready yes sir i'm ready now sir Uh, shall i share my presentation please please yes yes we can see the screen please go ahead and uh, restrict it to maximum of 7 minutes or 8 minutes okay sir okay sir thank you very much i'm uh, asif iqbal kausa uh, my topic is review of various uh, methods of electricity theft detection in conventional and smart energy meters 
uh, I'm uh, working on this th on this project under the supervision of Dr. Deepak Prashar, who is an assistant associate professor at LPU, lovely professional university, Punjab. So let me talk about first electricity theft. Electricity theft is in practical. <clears throat> it is in practical like the. Uh, it is in practice of uh, stealing electrical power. It is one of the major concerns worldwide. Electricity utility companies are losing ninety-six billion dollars every year due to the electricity theft. Electricity theft is a complex research problem with several influential parameter, parameters like socioeconomic, regional, infrastructural, corruption, corruption, managerial, and other things. In general, electricity theft occurs at when some consumers indulge in line tapping and meter tapping. I'm basically working on the uh, on the line tapping and meter tapping in smart energy meters. The main electricity theft attacks can be categorized into three groups. One is a physical attack. In this type of attack, malicious users tamper smart meters physically to lower down the meter readings. Examples can be by passing the meter form uh, to, to, uh, to record or measure less. Then there is one more attack that is called cyber attacks. Here, malicious users remotely compromise meters or modify the firmware on meters using communication technology. Data attacks, uh, uh, here, malicious users compromise meter uh, readings through cyber attacks and physical attacks, thus reducing the number of electricity bills. <clears throat> electricity theft uh, detection uh, is an extremely tough uh, for utilities to detect and confirm uh, with high accuracy uh, in domestic and commercial in, uh, lines. And uh, it is extremely tough for utilities to detect and confirm electricity theft in domestic, commercial, commercial, industrial establishments, in rural and uh, large cities, where on site inspections are very expensive and inefficient. It is isn't rudimentary to understand that the theft is a major theft is a major area of concern to date, and there is pressing need for a pragmatic solution for the same. However, due to the imbalanced data, overfitting issues, machine learning algorithms usually have higher false positive rates in the energy theft detection methods. I'm basically saying, uh, uh, showing the three methods where we are using the machine learning for detection of energy theft. One of the uh, technique is based on state uh, in which, uh, in which uh, some hardware is also installed or embedded into the, in the uh, smart meters. And then uh, since this, there uh, exists the hardware, so the cost of is, uh, cost is not feasible because for every smart meter, we need to uh, embed one uh, sensor device. Then there is one more technique that's a game theory. Game theory based solutions have low cost for finding electricity theft. It is necessary to define the utility function for all the players. This is basically the limitation because for every customer, for every consumer, we need to have a separate function, which is a time consuming for detection of a theft. Then machine learning, a data driven approach is used to effectively detect anomalous consumption behavior. Basically here, uh, we are using the historical historical consumption behavior of the consumer over, over a year or two years. And then based on that, we presume or we assume what will be his, uh, the consumption behavior next. And based on that, we uh, basically detect the anomaly. So this is one of the option that uh, smart meters have been installed to reduce the theft. The machine learning algorithms, <coughs> machine learning algorithms here, are trained on a customer historical energy consumption to be able to predict the consumption behavior and detect abnormality in energy usage and irregularity between the predicted energy usage and current energy usage will, will be flagged as an anomaly and a potential theft then. The challenges in the electricity theft detection models are imbalanced nature of data. As we see that electrical consumption data will be having more of the 
more of the non-theft data. So the data in the data set will be imbalanced. For that, what we uh, usually do, we, synthesize, we put a synthetic data, that's a false data of the theft. And that is almost the almost similar to similar to the uh, theft data and we balance the data set by using the technique like synthetic uh, uh, theft detection theft uh, technique uh, data into it uh, the ml techniques are basically detecting the one big i could base big clear the chapter what i was thinking Am I audible? Yes, 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 you are audible. Please go ahead. There are some okay. technical issues. Okay, okay. So ensemble uh, technique is basically the combination of one or more uh, machine learning techniques to uh, uh, to make the to make the uh, the weak weak uh, uh, estimator basically a strong estimator to detect the theft. So the energy theft detection by using ensemble technique can be done using this methodology. First of all, the data acquisition, then the data pre-processing where we need to clean the data, where, where we need to fill the, uh, the data where the data is not recorded. And then we need to remove the imbalance and the, we remove the imbalance using the technique called oversampling, undersampling. There are various number of techniques and usually we are using the synthetic minority oversampling technique known as smooth to uh, remove the imbalance in the data set. Implement uh, then the ensembling classifier and then we evaluate the uh, evaluate uh, the results. So here I am showing the uh, the schematic diagram basically the the overall this framework how we can detect this energy uh, theft. I have used uh, this technique. Uh, I have used uh, energy uh, detection technique using ensemble learning technique uh, using an XG boost is extreme uh, gradient boost technique, wherein I have found accuracy of 93% and the recall of 92% with a precision of 95% and F1 score of 93%, Kappa of 86% and MCC of 86 uh, percent. I have compared the my uh, thesis, research thesis of this paper, uh, of this uh, model with the other uh, benchmark models like k neighbor, MLP, uh, random forest, uh, support vector machine, linear RNN, extra trees, and uh, the detection rate of this XG boost and smooth technique used is uh, higher as compared to the detection rate of the benchmark techniques. And, uh, and the main thing is that the, I have been able to achieve the, the, the reduced false positive rate of 1.58 only as compared to the other uh, uh, benchmark uh, machine learning techniques for energy theft detection. Uh, so this is basically my results, which I have achieved using this uh, model that is XG boost and this. So with this, uh, I would like to end my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for your wonderful presentation. Uh, please share your details out here in chat box. We would love to get in touch with you. Okay, okay. Yeah. thank you. Sir. Uh, we will take the question later. Uh, later. So next I would like to call Nahida Safi. We have Nahida. Nahida. Please unmute yourself, Nahida. Hello, sir. Okay, then I. Nahida, are you there? So, am I audible? Yeah, can you present now? Okay, sir. Shall I start, sir? Yeah, please go ahead. Please start. Please, can you share the screen? Yes, sir. Yes, yes. Yeah. 
Sir, is a screen clear to all of you? Yes, it is clear. Thank you. Okay, sir. So I would like to start with uh, the following. I have mentioned here the contents. It's the research objective and approach. Then I will discuss what is the problem definition. Uh, then the literature review. Then uh, what is the conceptual uh, framework behind my research and uh, um, coming with the various methodologies and what exactly we have found in our research. Then what are the uh, loopholes or the limitations? Then fi uh, finally the references. So, so I will start with the uh, research objective and the approach. So the objective of a research is basically uh, that we will build in a uh, hierarchical uh, multitask model that will perform a uh, intent detection. Uh, presently, we are doing it on a text data set where we want to find out the intent in text uh, and a slot filling tasks for the data sets of varying domains. So here uh, we introduced a, a, a stage, like we introduced a models, uh, which incorporates a latent direct allocation along with the various word embeddings. And here we used word to work and uh, we have also used glow in our research uh, for finding the various embeddings. And then we incorporated into our final model that is the conditional random field. So that uh, finally we want to build a model, a predictive model, most probably that will uh, find a uh, uh, in text right uh, so that will find that will be able to find the various modelings or the sequential linkages between uh, the various uh, interconnected nodes like for intent detection and slot fling so then comes the problem definition so the problem definition is like what, what exactly we are going to find out in our research is an intent detection and slot filling. Now coming to the point what exactly an intent detection is, it's basically uh, a semantic uterine classification. Uh, like it's like what is the weather today? Like So uh, we want to know what exactly this sentence is about. So this sentence is about, we want to find that this query is about uh, finding the intent, right? Finding the weather. So then we will uh, locate it in the prescribed uh, label that is the slot filling. So slot filling requires to fill in the values for a predefined sets of slots in the semantic frame. So for every utterances. Sir, am I audible to all of you? Hello, yeah, sir. We can hear you. Yeah, yeah, we okay, can okay. hear you. Okay, I will continue. So uh, we started uh, uh, firstly with the various literature review. So the, the, these are the classical methods like for uh, finding the intent in the in the text. So various models have been used like we have the new, new base logistic regression, decision trees, support vector machines. So these are the various methods, but there were uh, lots of limitations in this. Um, like the statistical models, uh, they were using the maximum entropy model for intent. Then uh, from 2016 onwards, uh, lots of papers have been explored. I have uh, actually uh, seen uh, what exactly they were using for detecting intent in any text query. So there were uh, the recurrent neural uh, models, LSTMs. Uh, we have a slot uh, tagging task in softmax classifiers. We use uh, they are, they use the by LSTM, and uh, uh, and after that, after uh, uh, I think uh, 2017 onwards, they incorporated encoder decoder. These are the transformers in the by LSTM for intent and slot prediction. So there have been lots of uh, papers uh, which uh, they have taken the slot detection and intent. Sorry, slot filling and intent detection. Uh, separately but uh, from 2019 onwards they take it together and it was really a huge uh, research like in this context and it has shown that there were an increase in the accuracy and lots of things there so uh, this is the attention mechanism uh, so they also incorporated attention mechanism in uh, this uh, um, with the recurrent neural models so these are the transformers. So uh, we get to know that about transformers, uh, these models were used, uh, the transformer architecture, like we see these embeddings, 
they were also incorporated in these transformers for intent detection, right? So this is the conceptual uh, framework of our model, like how exactly our model works. So firstly, we take our, uh, we uh, got the training data sets. We uh, uh, incorporated data from multiple sources, like we go for the social networking sites and we collected lots of raw data. And after the pre-processing steps, we, uh, uh, what we did basically, we just try to find out the embeddings, the relationship between the various words. So in the vector form, then after that, uh, this uh, learning, that's a feature engineering. After feature engineering, we incorporated word embeddings in our models for uh, predicting uh, the, uh, uh, for this predicting, for making our pre uh, model prediction, right? Uh, then this is exactly the conceptual framework for our model. So this is the data sets. Here I have given a brief Please, glimpse. Uh, you have two minutes more left. Uh, Please wind it up at our list. Okay, okay. So th these are the various uh, data sets here uh, on which we trained our models. So you can see it's clearly mentioned here. So these are the examples. Like you can see here, the various fo uh, following queries are there. So like, how do I buy a Bitcoin? So here the intent is about the Bitcoin. It's about cryptocurrency, right? So lots of things. So main work is over that we want to know the intent. If uh, if a user is giving a query, we should be able. So main, our main research is rounded around the chatbots. Uh, like you know about Alexa and Siri is there. They're also working on the same mechanism, but still they are a loop. This is the uh, algorithm on which our... Uh, this model is working so i don't i will not go into the depth so these are the various equations we have used these are the conditional random field so this is our research findings we have seen that our model have performed uh, very well uh, when we compare it with our uh, baseline so our model have uh, talking about the accuracy and other things so this is uh, the final results here Semantic and synthetic relationship. This is basically showing how the uh, text is uh, related to each other. So this is uh, the data sets like these are the papers. Uh, we have compared our work with the following papers and we have seen that our accuracy is about 98%. F score is about 96% and uh, ATIS data is an airline travels system data and second is a sign it's a spoken language uh, data set so these uh, these these are the two data sets and these are the following papers so these papers have used the same data set and we too use the same data set and these are the various results how our accuracy and f1 scores have performed well when compared to the state, uh, state of the uh, art of works so these are still the limitations in our model here we will also want to uh, pursue our research again so we will also these are the research gap, gap and these we uh, will go for our future work like it's mentioned on the slide. So if uh, there's any questions they can ask. These are the various reference. So I will conclude my presentation. Hope uh, you will get uh, got an idea about how our research is about and what are the results we have found till now. Thank you. Thank you for your uh, wonderful presentation, Aida. Uh, it was a good presentation. Thank you. Please share you, your uh, details out uh, here, uh, email ID and uh, the topics, what you are, I mean, your area of research and all in the chat box. We will get in touch with you and also queries, question answers, we will just get in touch at the end of the presentation. Thank you. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. So now let's go ahead with the next participant for the day. I would like to now call upon uh, Kunal. Do we have Kunal? Yeah, please share your presentation, Kunal. Yeah, we can see the screen. Please go ahead. Please go ahead. Please start your presentation. We're not able to hear you. Yeah, 
okay maybe some technical issues from your side then is it fine uh, are you can you remove your earphone you are, we are not able to hear you yeah can you talk now yes sir hello i am not able to hear okay maybe we will go ahead with the next presenter and then come back so i would like to call upon the next presenter uh, mukund mukund kulkarni yes sir Thank yes. You, please uh, share your presentation. Yeah. We'll go ahead. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, I am Mukund Murli Kulkarni. I am a research scholar from the School of Vedic Sciences at MIT ADT University at Pune. My research paper is about the mental health, personality, and social behavior analysis. This is based on Vedic psychology. Uh, actually the ancient indic psychological knowledge in ayurveda and spirituality has great impact on individuals to make them follow the social norms and controls on behavior vedic psychological knowledge is at par with the modern modern psychology it has more impact on the personality it advocates smooth and social relationship it prevents the deviation from the path of virtuous and conscious behavior concept of pap pap and punya in uh, ancient indic psychology that lead, uh, leads to the purity of the mind and make the people self disciplined people with vedic psychological knowledge need no law and order because they are self controlled swayam shasit what we call it as swayam shasit for the good behavior the sources of uh, vedic psychology ancient indic vedic psychology and the knowledge system covers the majority portion of the modern psychology broadly the psychological knowledge is available in ayurveda patanjali yoga sutra yoga vashishtha and bhagavad gita these are the main important granthas in ancient indic sciences and knowledge system wherein you can derive the total psychological system which is at par with our present modern psychology the learning from these granthas is nothing but training of the mind and control of the mind and hence the behavior of the people when the trained mind is always behaves properly vedic uh, vedic psychology inspires people it is the self inspiration because of which people behave in social norms ethics etiquettes and protocols the ideal behavior is suggested in dharma shastras and niti shastras they are the fundamental principles of the mind control fundamentally mind control is the thing which has been taught by our indian ancient knowledge system purity of the thought leads to the sound mind healthy physical body conditions and the life peaceful life i'll shift this one minute now many times many a time it is observed that the persons behave differently that this is social psychology people behave differently because they, when they are alone and when they are in groups the reasons for this difference in behavior is because of the social and cultural pressures or the influence of the group psychology if the behavior is different than the social norms etiquette cultures and set standards of the expected behavior then it is personality disorder such personality disorder people create crimes unrest abuse and disorder in the social society social persons behave properly they don't need all those things actually they follow the rules and they follow the social psychological system fundamentally social psychology is the scientific study how the people behave 
how the people's thoughts, feelings, thinking, beliefs, and intentions are different from each other. They are constructed from the social point of view. This is what the uh, social uh, system teaches us. Now, how Vedic psychology controls this? Indic philosophy of life and spirituality believes in one, the knowledge that prompts behavior. Whatever the knowledge you have got, accordingly your behavior will be there. Attitude prompts the knowledge and the gunas prompt the attitude. They are depending upon one another. Samskaras prompt gunas. Fundamentally, the samskaras are very important in Vedic system because they prompt gunas and hence the behavior. Samskaras consist of the consist of prayers to the God, faith and confidence in Ishwara and Guru, respecting parents and all elders, following the path of truth, honesty, timely eating good, clean, fresh, wholesome food, and the principles of dharma. Vedic psychology is mind-based. Fundamentally, it is mind-based. It understands brain as a part of chitta. I will explain how the chitta is and how the brain is a part of chitta. It affects the mindset and the mindset of a person affects his behavior. This is the psychology. Purusha, Purusha is not the uh, male person, but it can be considered as female also. Purusha is the Vyakti. Purusha is combination of Dhatu, Indriya, Manasa, Buddhi, and Atman. This is what our ancient Indic system teaches. The behavior of Purusha depends upon all these six parameters. But the main fundamental controlling parameter is Atman and his Manas. We call that as our inner vice. I will just touch it to the Chitta Bhumis. There are five types of Chitta Bhumis. And uh, the manavritti depends upon the chitta bhumi. So, kshipta, vikshipta, mudha, ekagra are the things which are the types of chitta bhumi, which finally controls the uh, manavritti, which is depending upon pramana, vikalpa, viparyaya, nidra, and smriti. Basically, um, Indian uh, ancient knowledge system consider different, two different things. One is the Manasa Prakriti and the other is Sharira Prakriti. A um, healthy person is not only bodily, he should be uh, fit or disease free, but he should be also, should have Prasanna Manavritti. His Chitta Vritti must be also Prasanna. That is what uh, we have been taught in this. Therefore, Sharira Prakriti is different and Manas Prakriti is different. Sharid Prakriti is basically depending upon the three doshas. That is what has been told in Ayurveda. That is Kapha, Pitta, Vata. Important thing in this is they are all the permutation and combination of Kapha, Vata, Pitta has been decided at the time of conception and it is fixed for the life. That defines a person as his identity. As compared to that, we have got Manasa Prakriti which is depending upon three gunas, that is sattva, raja, and tamasa. There are different types of personalities from each area, which have got different type of behavior. For example, sattva prakriti people, they can have brahma kaya, mahendra kaya, varuna kaya, kubera kaya, gandharva kaya, yama kaya, and rushi kaya. Whereas the tamasa people, they are pashu kaya, Matsya Kaya, Vanaspataya Kaya, and Rajas people are Asura type of people. They are Rakshas type of people. They are Pishacha type of people, likewise. So, depending upon the contents of the gunas of a person, the person behave differently. So, what all we need to do in this is we have to get everybody converted into Sattvaja Prakriti. Here, I have come to uh, uh, this thing. The sattvic prakriti mind denotes the kindness, truth, faith, and good memory. They do not run after the materialistic things. They have never ever uh, intentions to hurt others. They are calmly, uh, they calmly expect, uh, express the truth. By nature, they are religious and have ultimate faith 
and confidence in the God. They are honest, hardworking, and intelligent. They carry out the work that is karma without the anticipation of the fuller. Now, depending upon that, Rajas Pravriti people are there, they are having anxious and they are overwhelming, they are materialistic, they have got lust for the food and money, they get a great sense of pride, ahamkara, they are having with ahamkara. Compared to that, Tamas Pravriti people, they are uh, they never achieve moksha, they never have, they, they do not have indecisive mind and slippery character. They are lazy and do not want to work. They fail to identify the reality or truth and they take wrong side of the situation. Conclusion of this is Ayurveda has total theoretical background of psychology. The knowledge is at par with the modern psychology. The ancient Vedic psychology has capability to analyze and control the behavior. The behavior control, we have seen that. The system can derive the social norms very simple, practical, and comprehensive manner. Behavior can be analyzed depending upon personality as we have studied a lot of personality. Ayurveda recommends to promote the people of sattvic pravritti. Society with sattvic, uh, sattvic people will be progressive and peaceful. It will reduce the crime rate, unrest, sexual harassment, etc. The behavior of the people will be as per the social norms and no difficulties in cognition, emotions, and interpersonal relationship. So the psychology, Vedic psychology, teaches almost everything to us with a simple manner. Thank you so much. Sir, it was a very enlightening session uh, and uh, I personally learned a lot with respect to your talk. We will connect with you and uh, learn more uh, about it and we will spread it across to other people also. Very nice uh, research, very nice topic and a good uh, work actually, sir. Thanks a lot uh, for enlightening. We will be in touch. Sir. Please share your details in the chat box. Sir. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Nice, uh, nice to hear your talk, sir. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, now uh, let us uh, go ahead with the next presenter. Uh, Sorry um, to interrupt, sir, in between. Uh, can I have my presentation now? I have an urgent meeting. I'm a joint director of Ministry of Information Technology. Oh, is that? Okay, well, please go ahead. No issues. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you so much. Uh, hope it's it's visible. Yeah. Yes, yes, it is visible. Good afternoon, all. Uh, my paper is regarding enhancement of web accessibility of Indian government website using artificial intelligence. I am Tejal Tiwari, research scholar at uh, 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 SRM University at Ghaziabad campus. Uh, I have uh, written this paper in association with my guide, Professor R.P. Mahapatra. He is HOD of the Department of Computer Science. So the abstract of my paper is that nowadays, uh, internet is the main key source of all the information uh, for, in every field of life. So even government websites are uh, important, uh, have started their services online through their websites. So it is very important that all the users, regardless of their disabilities, should be able to access websites in an effective member, manner. So in this in inclusive development, like uh, our honorable prime minister is also enforcing that we should include uh, that disabled people should be inclusive of our society. So uh, it's very important that uh, disabled people, people should uh, be able to uh, see this uh, website uh, and interact uh, with the web. So uh, there are uh, very many features which can be added while developing uh, to make them uh, accessible. Otherwise, my, my research or my study is that uh, how artificial can be useful for uh, disabled people to remove their difficulties in uh, accessing the uh, government websites and any website, in fact. 
So like the inventor of World Wide Web, uh, Tim Berner said that the power of web is in its universality. Access by everyone, regardless of disability, is an essential aspect. So uh, what is web access accessibility? Web accessibility means that websites, tools, and technologies are de designed in such a manner so that people with disabilities can use them. Uh, uh, to be more specifically, that people can perceive, understand, navigate, and interact with the web and contribute to the web. Then it is called that website is accessible. And uh, web accessibility uh, encompass, encompasses all disabilities such as visually impaired, auditory impaired, speech, cognitive, neurological, and physical, and many more. Uh, it's not web accessibility is not for only for disabled people. It, it helps for the older people also, people with low literacy also, and people with low bandwidth or uh, new and infrequent users. I'll come how it is connected with the old people and how with the illiterate people. Like there are various uh, web accessibility perspectives, like video caption for hearing disabled. Like in a website, if there is any video, then there should be a caption so that a hearing impaired can read the caption and understand what is there in that video. And colors with contrast uh, in a website, it should have a good uh, contrast and uh, good colors so that uh, colorblind or uh, old age people can see this, see the website and access the website. And another is text to speech is for dyslexia as well as visually impaired. Generally, visually impaired people access the web through a screen reader. And screen reader, what does it does? It does uh, it changes text into the speech. And then uh, uh, there should be a clear layout design for cognitive and learning disabilities so that they can navigate the website easily. And there should be a large links, buttons, and controls for low vision so that they can increase the font of the, there, there should be an option for increasing the font of the website so that a low vision people can uh, check it. And customizable text change in size and color, that's what I said, and understandable content should be there. And it, there should be keyboard compatibility, like uh, visually impaired or physical uh, disabled person cannot move the mouse properly. And uh, uh, so they use the keyboard, like screen reader goes through the tab reading, the tab setting, It uh, website is accessed through a tab. So keyboard compatibility should be there and image classification should be there for visually impaired. Like if there is an image, then there should be a, a alternate text for that. Uh, because uh, visual, uh, screen reader will not be able to describe about the image. So visually impaired will not be able to um, get that what is that image about. Screen reader will just say that it is an image. So what is that image about? Then there should be an alternate text for this in the website. And how artificial intelligence can enhance the web accessibility? There are uh, different algorithms and machines uh, uh, which can be uh, helpful for making the website accessible. Uh, with the uh, AI solution, uh, website owners can make their site accessible without altering their source code. Due to AI-based technologies, persons with disabilities are able to access websites. AI is helping persons with disability to interact with the web like other people does, like uh, we have Alexa, Google, Siri, and all that. Uh, in my study, I had just gone through the Indian government websites and uh, for effective governance, government websites are also there to have an interface between government and its citizen. So uh, website can be made accessible if they are complying to the international guidelines, uh, which is uh, launched by World Wide Web Consortium. International guidelines are web content accessibility guidelines. It has 12 to three gu guidelines organized into four principles. Uh, basically it's called four. Four means P for perceivable, O for operable, U for understandable and R for robust. And under these guidelines, there are success criteria. Success criteria determine the conformance to WCAG. That is in order to meet the WCAG, the content need to meet the success criteria. Means the uh, website should be developed uh, following the, these guidelines then it will be accessible. And we can uh, test whether the uh, website is accessible or not uh, through automated tools. 
and since automated tools cannot uh, give a 100% result so manual testing is also required so manual to uh, automated tools are useful to obtain good quantitative view about the state of accessibility of a website and uh, manual evaluation necessary to supplement the result of the automated test and provide a more qualitative analysis of the accessibility and usability issues of a website like if an image is having a description uh, alternate text uh, i just i told you uh, screen reader will read that but screen an automated tool will uh, tell yes it is as per the wcag compliance because uh, it is having an alternate text but whether that uh, text is relevant or not that can be done only through manual testing only human man can uh, uh, can decide that whether this is uh, appropriate text or not so uh, automated tool as well as manual testing is required so i studied 10 indian government website and tested through two different tools one is power mapper sort site and another is wave and i got this result and this is the error error report since uh, it has a 13 guidelines and 61 success criteria so uh, and uh, uh, under the four principles so i have taken mainly uh, first principle that is perceivable that it should have a uh, alternate text and it these are the contrast error and missing alternative text, linked image missing and missing from label, empty heading, empty link, empty button. These uh, are the few parameters which I have taken in these 10 websites. The graph for this is, this was through sort site and this is for wave. And we can um, observe that um, for both the tools, they are uh, from both the tools. We found that uh, all the websites are not complying to principle one. Principle one uh, says that website content information and user interface should be perceivable. Uh, in the all the ten website, uh, it has been observed the maximum error is of missing alternate text through both the tools. Uh, this means that they are not complying to guideline one point one according to which alternate text should be provided for any non-text content so that it is readable by screen reader for visual impair. Both the tables shows that there is a uh, 1.4 guideline uh, is also not been uh, followed because they are not having a uh, separating foreground and background, uh, hence not appropriate contrast. Uh, and in these two, we can see that there is a one website of Jal Jeevan department has maximum number of errors having alternate text non-alternate text of the images by both the tools. So how in inter artificial intelligence, uh, there are few solutions regarding that. It's uh, AI can remove accessibility barriers to different solutions. There are uh, like automatic image recognition for visually impaired, automatic alternative text for again for visually impaired and text summarization for people with a mental impairment and real time captioning or translation for hearing impaired and even for people who don't speak the language. So in automatic image recognition, what is that? You can recognize the images with the help of AI-based image processing, like Google Vision API uses neural network to recognize images. With this tool, visually impaired are able to differentiate between two images, like if, whether it is an image of an animal or a, or a human. Similarly, there are uh, through deep learning, we can uh, create an alternate text of an image. Uh, so uh, deep learning and convolution neural network can uh, do image classification uh, and generate alternate text for an uh, image assisting visually impaired. And basic information about images in a website can be generated through artificial intelligence and refinement of information can be done through crowdsourcing. And similarly, information summarization, like there are very lengthy documents and there are PDF files which visually impaired cannot see. So with the AI algorithms, these text uh, summarization can be done and PDF summarization can be done. It is, uh, is breaked into small chunks of text readable for blind through this screen reader. And another is real-time captioning for video. Uh, real-time captioning can be done using automatic speech recognition algorithms, which creates caption and subtitles for online video. Like uh, example is Microsoft Translator. Another example AI technology is Google Translate, which is enhancing uh, web accessibility. And the conclusion is that uh, shows that government websites are not fully accessible to person with disability. So for inclu inclusiveness of uh, persons with disability in day-to-day -day life, government website need to be made accessible 
through artificial intelligence technique like computer vision, NLP, deep learning, and many more. These are the references uh, which I have referred while writing this paper. And that's all. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for your wonderful presentation. So please share your details out here in the chat box. Yes, and just sir. add on one extra point. Uh, we have uh, tested more than 100 the government websites uh, like five years before, and we got these problem issues uh, 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 voluntarily. And then we raised a petition to government of India also regarding the same uh, to rectify the yes. issues and all. Sir, I'm, work I'm working in ERNET India. That's an autonomous body of uh, Ministry of Information, Technology and Communication. We okay. are doing one project under this, under Accessible India campaign, in That's which great. we are making state government website accessible. And till now, we have made almost 700 websites accessible, state One government point. websites. In 2015 16, we wrote the petition uh, saying that it should be accessible and all. So that's uh, through the NGO, one of the NGO which we are closely working with from Bangalore. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. If we in touch, ma'am, we will, uh, we would, I would like to get collaborated and uh, see how yeah. uh, first, uh, we can uh, serve the society through accessibility. Sure, sir. Sure, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Well, uh, we'll go ahead with the next presenter for the day. Uh, so now I would like to call upon uh, Hamas. Do we have Hamas? It's Hamza, Hamza. Oh, so sorry. Oh, yeah, please, Hamza. Yeah. Please go ahead and. Yeah, okay. Yeah, we can share your, we can see your screen. Okay, can you see my screen right now? Yes. Okay, please, that's uh, great. Share the presentation. PPT, we can't see. One second, let me just, yeah, now we can see. Yes. Okay. Please go That's ahead. Fine. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Uh, actually, my research is about like it's applied research it's about uh, to implementing an optimization algorithm for like combinatorial optimization problem. So, what I'm going to give you an introduction about like combinatorial optimization problem and what is the team oriented problem, which is like it's one part of the optimization problem. And was it the arithmetic optimization problem that being used actually uh, to solve a uh, team oriented problem? And I'm going to discuss the problem statement and then the proposed algorithm. Then I'm going to show the result and conclusion and future work. So what is like, let's say, computer combined turn optimization problem actually, which like it's appear in the real world. And we are like facing that many times in the combined, in the operational research and on the, uh, in the operational research and in the artificial intelligent uh, bioinformatics and electrochemistry as well. And in this case, and this type of problem that we use actually an optimization algorithm to solve or to tackle this type of problem, and which is like we are depending on different factors such as like maximizing the profit, minimizing the operational cost, and then reducing the operational time. So those three factors, which is like it's usually going to be like let's say the main objective actually for each for each. Uh, algorithm uh, and uh, while it's using the, while it's used to solve the uh, combinatorial optimization problem. So the last thing actually which about the combinatorial optimization, it's mean like usually uh, we have an, a huge search space which like consists a billion of solutions. So the algorithm actually employed uh, to uh, select the best solution. Uh, among of those, uh, which is like among of you, among of those, actually a huge amount of solution. So, what is the team oriented problem? Actually, the team oriented problem is come actually from the sport game, which is called like team orienteering, and which is like it's uh, like let's say re representing different type of the operational research, such as vehicle routing, traveling sales map problem, and etc. And the uh, uh, calculation for those algorithm actually it's showing that it's an uh, uh, non-deterministic polynomial time hard problem which is like it has its need actually like it's cannot be solved by human actually and it should be solved actually by the its need and a uh, very high capacity computer and uh, like there is a big calculation it should be done to solve this type of problem. 
you know? and this type of problem it means actually like let's say it consists of two member or more that it will go through the several point and each point is going to be like having an a score and the uh, main objective of the algorithm actually to maximize the number of the uh, the score actually which is like here we can see like let's say the demonstration of the a problem which consists of the starting point and ending point and this is we can have actually like let's say two player or more or more uh, until we have like let's say six player as well and those player actually they have an unlimited time actually which to visit from the start point and end point and they have to visit actually as much as possible of the point because each point it consists it have an, a score so we need to maximize this number of the scores and one more thing actually each point could, could cannot be visit more than one one time so this is actually the idea of the uh, problem so like let's say we have different type of method that's been used to solve this type of problem such as we have an exact method and the heuristic and meta heuristic algorithm so in the exact method, actually, it's um, like most of the researchers, they try to avoid this type of method because it's like time consumption, because they are going to uh, test all the solution. Like, let's say, if we have, like, let's say, a, a thousand billion of solution, and then they're going to test all of them, and then they will always actually receive the same solution, which is like the same best solution. So in the heuristic and meta heuristic is like there is an a part we put like you say an a randomly part and or controlled randomly part which is like it's allowed the diversity of the solution this is what we are looking for sometimes when we are solving this type of the operational research or like this or scheduling problem so we should have some diversity we don't need an a fixed solution always so we that's why actually we allow for like let's say some uh, or sacrificing some uh, equality of the solution to gain and a diversity of the solution. So we have actually different type of the meta heuristic and hyper heuristic. We have like the constructive heuristic. We have a single solution based population based algorithm and hybrid meta heuristic algorithm. So all those solution actually while they are implemented, they are lack of flexibility to the work will and for all instances, and it have an, a complicated design which it make the development and uh, make it a little bit complicated actually uh, in the future work as well because like they are enjoying actually different type of the uh, algorithm so while we are why we are selecting an uh, arithmetic optimization algorithm actually in team orienting problem it's like it's an important problem because it's an, a schedule uh, scheduling problem and representing different type of uh, uh, optimization or combinatorial optimization uh, uh, problem. So we are selecting like uh, arithmetic optimization algorithm because actually there are some features such as it's used is used to solve for the team or problem first time and simple and flexible and success to solve and a several problem and exploitation and exploration. There is an a balance, which is like the main things about like the optimization or meta heuristic algorithm. And one more thing, actually, it's an a population based algorithm, and then it has all the meta heuristic feature. So what what is the problem that we are founded actually inside the optimization algorithm? Sometimes we are or like in the uh, like it should be like so when we are implementing this algorithm at the first time. The fair thing as as what we know, we have like you converted the problem to the numerical part. And then we are going to start with the initial solutions and should be diversified and then increase the computational time and the parameter convergence as well. And we have, like let's say, the search exploitation as well. So we have to focus actually on those, uh, like those problems to be solved while we are implementing the, uh, while we are implementing the arithmetic optimization algorithm. So what is the problem actually? What is the algorithm it's work? So it's gonna work actually within the several steps actually, such as we have the first thing, when we are starting, we should like initializing the uh, population base, which is like we have to initialize the population and then initialize the parameters. The parameters should be tested actually, and based on the preliminary study to select actually with that with the parameter. And then we are going to the while loop. We have an a current iteration. We have an a maximum iteration. 
because we do need actually to have or to increase the computational time. We should have actually them uh, like reduce the time and like gain the best solution within like an uh, let's say uh, specific time is it's like to make it like let's say less than uh, like let's say maybe like uh, 10 minutes or 15 minutes it's depend on the operation or depend on the instances as well then we have to calculate the fitness function for all the uh, para for all the population and then we have to determine the best solution among of those then we have to update actually like some parameters such as the moa mmop and then we have like let's say an um, such as of like let's say the decision and this decision which it like it's allow the algorithm to make a balance between the uh, exploration and exploitation which it like if we have an uh, we do need to stack actually in the local optima and we need to skip from the local optima to the global optima or to another local optima to find the best solution this is actually about the search space in fact actually uh, while we can see actually like R1, it's like a random number between zero to one, and we have the MOA, it's gonna be actually updated based on the solutions. So if we have an, a very good solution, and then the MOA, it's gonna be actually a small number. So the variety or like the possibility to go through the exploration, it's gonna be very high, which it's like it's gonna be go if the R1, the, 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 the random number, if it's greater than MOA, then it will go actually for two type, which is like a mutation operation and the crossover operation. And those it consider those operation it consider for the for the exploration part. And we have an exploitation part, which is like we have an um, insert neighborhood operator and we have this way swap neighborhood operator. And then we finish the first iteration, then we continue actually for the next iteration and etc. So the algorithm actually does the process, it's gonna be actually end up when the when we reach actually the maximum number of iteration and while we are reaching the maximum number of iteration we are going to select the best solution among of all of those process and then we are going to represent this type of the solution just one more thing actually here about like this algorithm which is like they are not going to retrieve always the same solution so we have a type of variety of solutions so we are like let's say not depending on one solution when we are running the algorithm which it like it's gonna give us some 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 flexibility and we might get uh like let's say uh, like uh, like let's say a differences between the solution based on the equality as well so here we have like let's say the algorithm like how it's working actually the algorithm usually actually in the exploration uh, in the exploration area in the search space it's gonna be like a little bit far from the good solution because uh, we need to sacrifice some quality of the solution to gain an, a good solution because we are going to jump from the different local optima in the uh, in the in the meta heuristic algorithm as well. So here is actually showing, like let's say, the result for like seven instances, and we can see actually here like such as like let's say the first, like second, and third, and fourth instance, the third instances, we are gaining an, a good result because we are going to retrieve the good solution with the best solution, actually. And here we have actually like in the fourth and uh, five and six and seven instances, we have like, let's say, an, a competition or like, let's say, an, a promising result here we can see in the among of those uh like instances or among of those instances of the uh of this type of the problem so here we can show actually even to like the, the the status of the candidate solution during the run of the uh, of the uh arithmetic optimization algorithm we can see in those instances how is the like the convergence is gonna be like let's say move within like let's say 10 less than 10 seconds sometimes to reach the uh good solution among of the of the different instances. And what is the advantage and disadvantage here in the algorithm, which it like it's easy to design and it's according is easy to develop as well. We can develop it is very easily and enable to obtain a competitive result that it could be actually equal to the best known result comparing with the literature as well. And just one thing actually about 
about like the algorithm we can notice for the future work, which is like it's gonna be like increase the balancing between the exploration part and exploitation part process by adding some uh, maybe adding some algorithms uh, like in Jeff, like some single base algorithm, which is like it's very was, simple. Uh, yes. Request you to kindly wind up by one minute. Come again. Okay, we have one minute. Okay, so the result actually here we can see it's like how it's gonna be like competitive with the like the with the literature review or like with the state of art algorithm. And at the end, actually, the last thing that I'm going to show based on the statistical analysis, actually, the arithmetic optimization algorithm, it's complete different type or different optimization algorithm, but it could not be the best among of them because we have an a hybrid scatter search algorithm, which is like it did the ranks actually number one, and then the, it's gonna be actually for the arithmetic optimization algorithm. So at the end, with the conclusion of the algorithm, which is like the new optimization algorithm or the arithmetic optimization algorithm, it's presented for the team or to orient any problem the first time, and it's it's gaining a good result among of the like state of art algorithms, and then the a new optimization algorithm, arithmetic optimization algorithm, which is like it presented, it's gonna be like it's gonna be solved, it's used to solve actually many times. So the future work we can likely say uh, add an uh, or hybrid the algorithm with the single base algorithm, or we can like see the performance of the algorithm and it could be improved by dynam by dynamically changing the parameter as well, and or we can like implement it on different type of the optimization algorithm, and this is the let's say the result that we are come out for the this type of the research. Thank you so much and. And if you have any question, don't hesitate to send me an email or uh, type it on the chat as well. Thank you so much. Thank you, Hamad, for your wonderful presentation. We'll get in touch. Uh, please share your credentials out here in the email. Uh, we will be in touch. So now let us go ahead with the next presenter for the day. Uh, I would now like to call, uh, do we have uh, Sayali Kadam? Face mask detection using image processing and deep learning. Sally. Okay. Now, next, uh, do we have Mohammed S. Makni, a uh, review of uh, agency theory from theoretical perspective? Okay, we, we don't have them both here. Fine. Fatma, do we have them here? Formulation of a hand sanitizer and its evaluation uh, for antimicrobial activity. Fatma, are you there? Okay, I don't see them here then. I'll go ahead with the next presenter. Uh, Tejal Tiwari, uh, I think it's done. Tejal Tiwari. Uh, Ajit uh, Bagli, yes, Design and Development of Inspection Conveyor System. Can I present now? Yes, please, please go ahead. Yeah, please start the presentation. Afternoon to all. Myself, Ajit Bali. I am a student of NI Mysore. I work under the guidance of Mr. Vinod sir and Mr. Kesha sir. Both are managing partners of Plantech Mysore. And even they are co authors of this paper. So our presentation will be in this manner. First, first of all, we'll explain about the company profile, which I work and I go to abstract, then introduction, literature survey, problem definition, objective methodology and result discussion and conclusion. Uh, so plan tech. 
team of young technology advisors interested to bring changes in the process of product development research and robotics started working on a project in their free time it all started in 2016 in mysore developed many concept and machines for different type of industrial equipments and educated several technical students and perfected their skill sets Contact officially formed in October 2020 at our registered offices in Mysore, Karnataka. Team Plantech has multitasking and multidisciplinary approach, having core strength in product and process design, development, industrial automation, and robotics with electromechanical base, IoT, basic process development, and also research areas for new technologies. Team Plantech has a professional team members having experience in companies such as ABB, Tata, G, L&T, and etc. When we come to industrial automation and robotics, we take concept generation, detailed design, manufacturing, assembling, throughout, and installation and commissioning of the following application areas like pick and place system, loading and unloading system, conveyors, assembly automation, vision system, special purpose machines. robotic integration testing machines iot process development this is abstract about the conveyor inspection system uh, which we are, which i am going to present now a man from early days try to automate things for his comfort but now lots of efforts are going to achieve accuracy precision and speed in growing mass production industries in this project The conveyor system has been designed with an indexing feature by using a timing belt with inserts. For the movement of parts from one end to the other, we used we used a technique called the telecentric measurement system for the measurement of the parts in 3D by using two set industrial cameras for measurement in both horizontal and vertical planes. The system has the capacity to measure the minimum measuring dimension of 40 microns and it has a trigger interval within 3 milliseconds. A deflector system is used consisting of a stepper motor attached to a deflector plate it will take input from a measurement system uh, which is a camera and deflect accordingly to sort the parts the whole system is integrated with the help of plc to make it closed loop as a result the proposed machine can sort an average of 20 parts per minute in real time we are not able to hear you ajay yeah yeah now we are able to hear you we were not your voice was muted we couldn't able to hear you at that moment a lot of got hacks so okay okay so. okay okay fine i am unable to go to next slide so oh if you have any difficulties what you can do is you can share the presentation in the chat box yeah right i can i can share it for you you can stop the share screen we'll go ahead with the next presenter and you can share me it share it to me over the chat box i will do the needful thank you okay once again so, yeah you can actually scroll through like this only is it okay yeah yeah that's fine yeah. uh, when we go to introduction now where is the manufactured part must be a certain you can you focus on the research work uh, which you have done rather than literature review and about the company yeah it would be great we don't want literature reviews coming to literature survey we have studied lots of papers yeah, please go ahead with the presentation uh, especially on the Yeah, problem definition. From problem definition, we would love to hear. In this automation era, we cannot rely on a human inspector in the high-speed production line for a quality inspection. Additionally, a human inspection cannot maintain the required micron level accuracy, especially when the parts are intended to for the aerospace, medical, or defense industries. These are some kinds of automatic automatic systems for inspection, but the setup cost is too high. Automatic systems are frequently employed in inspection system to sort the parts, although maintain them. can be challenging after that we have uh, set up some objectives like concept generation and development of inspection conveyor system complete uh, completely automatic uh, to achieve the parameters such as geometry motion force sensors and other uh, optical parameters as per customer requirement maintaining international standards Uh, fully automate the process to achieve maximum efficiency and minimum human 
the material and methodology we followed is firstly we did a literature survey and we set up the problem statement need objectives then we designed the three concepts concept one concept two and concept three and the selection of the concept by using a pug matrix then we uh, designed the whole uh, the conveyor system then we assembled the conveyor system in a plant tech then we did a testing of the machine uh, the images which are showing are the concept one images in this the whole conveyor assembly is mounted on the base assembly and two in industrial cameras are used to measure the dimension both in horizontal and vertical plane in this we have used 3430 mm length timing belt and accordingly uh, we accommodated 49 slats when skipping of the slats question comes we can skip only one slat per cycle The second concept we have uh, reduced the timing bit length from 3430 mm to 3360 mm, which helped up, uh, uh, accommodate 48 slats, which will help for skipping up uh, slats 1, 2, 3, 4 as uh, per cycle as per requirements. Uh, in the third concept, we have made moderate uh, change to the concept too by keeping the safety in mind. We have used uh, acrylic sheets to cover the entire conveyor and we can place assembly to avoid unwanted human interference and other objects. At the time of selecting the best concept, we used a puck matrix. We have selected 10 parameters such as slat skipping, easy of assembly, safety, uh, reliability, easy maintenance, adjustability, stability, and aesthetic look of the machine, and manufacturing, and the cost. Uh, from this, we can clearly uh, come to know that uh, concept three got uh, 37 points. So we have selected the concept three to develop. So uh, actual design and selection total three concepts are generated and the best concept is selected to develop. That is the concept the three. We used a software called a SolidWorks to design the entire system. We built our system with all the tested parts and assembled them validating our design ideas to meet customer needs. Uh, we have divided the entire system into five subsystems to make design and development easier, like base assembly, conveyor assembly, inspection assembly, reflector assembly, and pick and place assembly. Uh, for base assembly, uh, we consider various size aluminum profile to construct the framework. We used 40 into 80 profile where the load would be greater, and 40 40 profile where the load would be lower, and even 20 20 profile for the doors and other things. The purpose of using aluminum profile is that it offers a unique combination of aesthetic appeal and structural integrity. In the base, we have made a total three uh, compartments. One is to mount the CPU of the camera and the other two are for electrical panel. Uh, this is the exploded view of the base assembly. And when we come to conveyor assembly, we designed and built the conveyor in a V shape to allow space for the vertical camera light source. We also use the V-shape to get the extra length for the belt to mount slats. Hence, steel is used to make all the mounting plates, uh, height plates, uh, and bracket because it provides a high tensile strength and a high impact strength. Additionally, we did electrolysis chrome plating for all the manufactured part because ECP increases the hardness and durability of the surface, uh, and it prevents corrosion. Uh, this is the timing belt. At the at the time of designing a conveyor, the first step is selecting the conveying media to be used. For automation application, belt, chain, and uh, motorized rollers are the most common conveying media. When accuracy and repeatability are most important, then the recommended conveying media is timing belt because the positive engagement between belt and pulley together with the pre-tension. The belt tension can be varied by using the tensioner provided at the end. Uh, this is the timing belt calculation. So I won't uh, go into the depth. So this is the motor calculation. So this is the slats which we have uh, designed. Slats serves as the main mounting platform for the fixture where the parts that need to be inspected are positioned. We designed the transparent slats to allow the camera to capture clear image of the part under measurement. We utilized a material called polycarbonate sheet with the thickness of 12 mm to manufacture transparent slats. Uh, we inserted inserts into the timing belt in order to fix the slats. And then we fastened the slats to the timing belt using a screw. Uh, we made a square cutout 
in the slides to get a clear image from the camera. Now, this is the deflector assembly. A deflector system is used to consisting of a stepper motor attached to a deflector plate. Uh, it will take an input from the measurement system and deflect accordingly to the sort the parts. The plate is in home position. That part is not okay. If the plate deflects on the right side, the part is okay. We have used an air jet for an easy flow of parts in the plate. The home system is integrated with the help of PLC to make it close loop. And we have kept two pins. Blue color pin indicates not okay parts and orange color pin indicates okay parts. This is the inspection assembly. Exactly at 820 mm from the deflector end, the inspection assembly has been placed. I uh, used a uh, technique called the telecentric measurement system for the measurement of the parts in 3D. The system has the capacity to measure a minimum measuring dimension of 40 microns and it has the trigger interval within 3 milliseconds. And this is the weekend place assembly. And uh, this is the maximum moving mass is 0 0.1 kg. And Z axis has a stroke length of 150 mm. X axis has a stroke length of 500 mm. Uh, X axis maximum speed is 0 0.6 millisecond and Z axis maximum speed is 0 0.15 millisecond. And this is the concept design of our system and this is the final development system. When we come to result and discussion, the base assembly got passed uh, and conveyor assembly and mounting plates are passed. Fasteners and deflector assembly is conditional because fasteners, we found some kinds of rusting in some fasteners. And in deflector uh, assembly, we found some parts are falling out of the bar, uh, out of the pins. And we, and spacers and mounting plates, motors had got passed. And timing belt and inserts has failed because inserts are hitting slightly to the pulleys. Uh, pulley teeth and damage is observed. And cost is failed due to use of standard components and metal for manufacturing. And product life cycle is under testing. So right, right now it's untested. The conclusion, the main objective of this uh, project was to build a system to inspect parts with the less time. As a result, we designed and developed an inspection conveyor system. We met most of the customer requirements like less time, slide skipping, more accurate. At the time of testing, the major problem we faced uh, is assembly and belt slip uh, later. We solved all the problems by analyzing. The proposed machine can sort an average of 20 parts per minute in a real time. The inspection conveyor can be used for any kind of parts just by changing the fixture accordingly. And thank you. In any such uh, SPM machines, uh, mm -hmm. contact to the address and phone number mentioned in this. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. It was nice indeed. Uh, uh, presentation. We will get in touch. Uh, please share your details out there in the chat box. Uh, okay. we'll, uh, we will look into the question and answer session at last. Thank you. We'll go ahead with the next presenter. Uh, uh, I would like to call upon the next presenter, uh, Uma Shankar Viravalli. Do we have Uma Shankar Viravalli here? Yes. Hello, sir. Yeah, please. <coughs> uh, yeah, please share your presentation, sir. Sure. Yeah, we can see your screen. Please start. Yes. So, hello and uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Umashankar Veeravalli. And uh, today, we are going to talk about our paper titled Use of Playback Theatre with Assistive Technologies for Inclusion and Community Building for Persons with Disabilities. I am 100% visually impaired and a master's student at the uh, Department of Communication, University of Hyderabad. And I have co-authored this paper along with Radhika Jain, director and co-founder of First Drop Theatre LLP. First Drop Theatre LLP is a Bangalore-based uh, applied theatre company which uses applied theatre and expressive arts for uh, the cultural and social welfare of uh, different sections of society. One of our uh, aims is to create an accessible and inclusive society for everyone. and. Uh, a, a, a society where everybody has voice and everybody can interact with each other with empathy and agency. For this, um, to work towards this, we we opted for um, a theatre form called Playback Theatre. Playback Theatre is a social improv uh, form of theatre where audience members share their own personal stories from their lives 
and the, the actors and the performers perform those stories on the spot uh, um, using metaphors, words, imagery, music, and movement. So, uh, you know, when, when the entire world uh, was under lockdowns, the whole theater community around the world also started shifting towards online spaces. Uh, for first drop, um, we felt that this is an opportunity for us to work towards um, the inclusive and uh, uh, accessible society goal. So we reached out uh, to different parts of uh, uh, the country and we formed a team uh, with performers, uh, three performers um, with vision disabilities and two performers with locomotive disabilities. You know, online space meant uh, an opportunity for uh, uh, disabled people who otherwise had mobility and accessibility challenges. Now it is an opportunity for them to come and participate um, and uh, take part in uh, uh, things like, you know, playback theater, which otherwise would be uh, tough for them. So playback uh, uh, theater, uh, like I said, has, uh, uh, like I said, is a social improv form of theater. In this, we have a conductor who conducts uh, the performance, who acts as a, a conduit for the entire show, and three to four actors and a couple of musicians. So when we started meeting online, uh, uh, we uh, we have been meeting online on every Sunday uh, on Zoom platform, and uh, uh, visually impaired uh, uh, team members like me. We use screen readers such as Job Access with Speech (JAWS) and Non-Visual Desktop Access uh, (NVDA) uh, to to use uh, our phones, laptops, tablets, uh, and uh, to use software and uh, different applications. Um, so uh, we've been practicing since two years, like I said, and uh, in these two years, we've also collaborated with different social and uh, corporate organizations. And we have also put up uh, uh, several uh, public shows as well. The, the main aim behind all of this collaborations and public shows is to, uh, is to create awareness, is to create sensitization, is to uh, talk about uh, topics such as employment for disabled and um, accessible infrastructure for disabled and um, to talk about an overall idea of an inclusive society. So, uh, moving on to the discussion, um, you know, playback theater historically has been used to talk about many sensitivist issues such as gender discrimination, racism, war. Uh, playback theater has, uh, as a space, has that compassion and empathy because the stories are authentic. The stories are personal and powerful. So uh, it creates that space for everybody to come and uh, everybody to share. Uh, 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 and it, it creates that space to listen to everybody's stories. Uh, so, you know, initially it was, uh, we obviously had some hiccups. There were um, uh, initial challenges in terms of uh, working around uh, the accessibility issues uh, there were uh, uh, the, the, there was there was no tested method to teach playback theater for uh, people with disabilities especially in online spaces and uh, however we learned together we learned to respect each other's spaces we learned to uh, uh, respect each other's pace of learning and uh, we worked around it and obviously the screen reader challenges such as uh, accessibility issues of uh, online meeting platforms, for example, Microsoft Teams was not uh, uh, as accessible as the others. So we had to innovate different methods. We had to innovate methods of teaching movement to visually impaired, for example. So we had different workshops for that. So we uh, we worked around the accessibility issues, and uh, as a part of our uh, uh, you know, as, as a part of getting ready for the shows, we've also decided to make them more accessible by including sign interpreters for uh, people with hearing impairments, by announcing uh, accessible shortcuts, keyboard shortcuts uh, for uh, people with uh, vision impairments. And when we started doing these shows, uh, 
we had an immediate response from both disabled and non-disabled communities. They were intrigued, they were interested to know more about playback theater. And when they came, uh, the spaces have become safe and open. People started sharing impactful and powerful stories. Uh, these are lived experiences from their own lives. Uh, you know, with the added advantage of in, uh, internet and the online uh, spaces, uh, we could go, uh, we could reach out to different parts of the world. And uh, people with different mobility and accessibility challenges were uh, able to uh, join our shows, join for the shows, and uh, interact with, uh, uh, you know, interact with other uh, community members in the shows. And uh, in in these shows, we had uh, through these shows, uh, we 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 could bring out stories of community building, community building for people with disabilities, and where people with disabilities. Uh, worked for community building, for their own community building. And through these uh, shows, we could break several assumptions. Assumptions about non-disabled communities, assumptions about disabled communities. And uh, there were so many myths which were burst. There's so much of interaction which happened with empathy and agency. So we would like to conclude by saying that through this two years experience, what we found out is the synergy between playback theater and assistive technologies has a lot of potential. It is, it, it is a powerful space and uh, the, the biggest advantage is that uh, it gives us an opportunity to listen to everybody. It gives us an opportunity to interact with uh, each other and know each other better. Yes, of course, we also realize that, like I said, platforms need, need to be a little more accessible for uh, a visually impaired screen reader users. And what most importantly, what we realized is it's a constant process. Playback theater uh, to make it more accessible, to uh, take it to more people with different kinds of disabilities. It's a constant process. And we are, all of us are learning and we still have uh, a long way to go in that. However, uh, this through this these two years experience uh, uh, is you know is, is an evidence to tell that playback theater has limitless uh, potential in terms of uh, taking the idea of disability awareness into people. It has limitless uh, uh, potential in terms of creating an inclusive society where everybody is heard, where everybody is interact, uh, everybody is interacting with each other. And where everybody matters. This is our time. Thank you so much. Thank you. One of the unique and very nice presentation which I heard today. We will get in touch to understand more about this particular topic sure. uh, and Thank implementation you. also. Thank you. Please share your details also. Sure. Uh, sure. The conference we would like to get in touch. Thank you. Thanks. We will now go ahead with the next presentation. Jalal El Fadil. Uh, manager uh, managing risks related to uh, international projects in China. Uh, a case study of Canadian manufacturing company. Do we have them here? Jalali Fadil. Okay, do we have Abhishek Astana? Yeah, hi, this is Abhishek. I'm here. Yes, sir. Please share your presentation, sir. Yeah. Yes, now let me know if you are able to view my screen. I'm sharing it now. Yes, we are able to see the screen, so please go ahead. Super, thank you. So thank you, friends, for the wonderful presentations today. Uh, very knowledgeable, uh, great work done by everybody of you, and it's really nice afternoon spent uh, looking at your work. Good afternoon, friends. I'm Abhishek Asthana. I'm a research scholar at Sri Ravatpura Sarkar University, Raipur. I am working under supervision of Dr. Padmal Luchan Pradhan as my guide. And uh, the area of my research is access control mechanism on Unix operating system for risk assessment. For today's talk, I'll be talking about one of the work which we are doing uh, using combinatorial access control mechanism on Unix operating system. Uh, the contents of my presentation, I'll be going through quickly through access control, authentication, authorization, Unix permission, objective, Attribute based access control methodology and finally conclude. So, access control. So, uh, we all know that the exponential growth in online web based application and services 
have provided a tremendous opportunities for a variety of the businesses to grow and expand. Web-based businesses and applications have become a new normal in the society. Huge investment in IT infrastructure is being done. Services hosted over internet give business opportunity to operate around the clock and across the globe. And with bigger opportunity comes bigger risk. There is a constant threat of risk of unauthorized access to these servers and network which constitute organizational information systems. Information system is the most important asset for an organization. Large quantities of sensitive data are stored and uh, processed through these systems. Unauthorized disclosure of data can cause financial and social damages to organization. In short, access control uh, prevents unauthorized access to the resource and provide accountability to the user who accesses the resource. Access control is a mechanism which mediates every request to access a resource or a data by a user, and it determines whether the request should be granted or rejected. This is required to safeguard sensitive data from unauthorized user access. And access control is provided using authentication and authorization. They are the keys for access control. Authentication is a process to validate a user's identity. Identity confirmation is needed to give access permissions to a resource to the user. Authentication is provided using credentials in physical world. Example, we have identity cards and passports, which forms a key for us to authenticate a user. In digital world, username and passwords are the most popular format. Authentication work basically on three major factors, knowledge, ownership, and inheritance. Knowledge is what user knows, example, a password. Ownership, what user has, it could be a key or a badge. Inheritance, what user is, it could be biometrics. So nowadays, multi-factor authentications are very popular. In physical world, we have an ATM card, uh, something which, which a user has, and a PIN, uh, which is which the user knows. So this is multi-factor authentication. In, in digital world, username and password is what user knows his knowledge and OTP is what user has, which is shared via a shared medium. <laughs> authorization. Authorization is used to validate user's right. So once a user is authenticated, he is given certain set of privileges to act on particular uh, object. So authorization is performed after authenticating the user. The authorization for authorizing a, a user, uh, uh, most common methods is to use access control list or uh, uh, some kind of prefix lists. These lists gives, uh, maintain the list of permissions which can be given to the user. For authorization permission in Unix, uh, the, uh, ownership group and other, there are three levels and access modes are read, write and execute. So Unix uh, uh, was developed in 1986 when it was developed for the first time. That time, uh, in 1969, when it was developed in Bell Lab, uh, it was not designed to be secure. So it was, but however, it was designed uh, so that it has a characteristic which can make the security as serviceable. Unix later started getting adapted. And uh, in 1980s, it became very popular because of its networking, multi-user and multitasking feature. Ever since a lot of work has been integrated to Unix secure, to make Unix secure. Unix. If we see current uh, statistics, 70% of the network uh, devices like servers and others are running on Unix. So security in Unix is very, very important. So Unix uh, has, uh, uh, the file system in Unix has been divided broadly into three levels. Ownership permissions, like the owner of the file who is owning the uh, file, the what all, what all uh, uh, he can do with the file. Group permission, actions which a user who is a member of the group who, uh, for which the file belongs to what he can do and other permission with all other users that can perform. Similarly, uh, the access mode to the file has been divided into three categories, read, write, and execute. Capability to read the content of the file, capability to modify the contents of the file and execute the, the file as a, a permission. The work, uh, the, this uh, research work, uh, the, we are uh, doing this research study on access control mechanism, which aims to design an algorithm and prevent uh, to prevent uh, the operating system from unauthorized access and hackers. 
and uh, we are using Unix file system attributes for the same. Uh, that is, read, write, and execute uh, things uh, to manage this. The research aims to design and develop an optimization and normalization model using Unix system file attributes. Aim is to develop a model which can prevent itself from any attack, auto detect any attack, and immediately take corrective actions to recover from the attack. Attribute uh, based access control on which the research is based is also known as policy based access control. Attribute based access control takes decision uh, using attributes like user, resource, action, and environment. User is the individual who is trying to access the resource through user ID, the user name, ID. Resource is the server, database, or any uh, financial record or any important file. Action is what the user is uh, planning to do with the resource, whether he wants to read it, view it, transfer it, or delete it. Environment is the location from where uh, the resource is getting accessed. Access control, uh, attribute based access control uses these pol use, uh, policies to grant and access or deny access uh, to a server. Access, uh, attribute based access control policies define which combinations of user subject environment attributes are needed to perform an action. Example, uh, a sales, uh, sales, a sales manager working in Netherlands. The get transferred or, or uh, for a company XYZ and get transferred uh, to uh, take care of Asia Pacific. So once he's transferred, his company is not changed, his uh, role is not changed. What has changed for him is the location. Being in Asia Pacific, he does not need to have access to the customer database and financial records for the customers in uh, for, for uh, the company, uh, for the customers uh, which he was serving in Netherlands, for which he was working in Netherlands. So there, the environment comes into picture. Attribute-based access control makes this simple for an organization to manage uh, employees uh, within the organization. So our study is based on combinatory uh, methodology. Work is based on combinatory method which uses uh, components of Unix file system access control mechanism to evaluate the performance of data security, risk assessment, and information. So combination rules of permutations is applied so where uh, few or all of, uh, all or few objects are selected and uh, uh, all permutation and combinations of them is there, we do not account for in what order uh, the selection is made. To understand it simpler, uh, like uh, no permission uh, to a file system is considered to be like zero, a uh, numeric num number has been assigned to it. Read is given one, write is two, uh, uh, execute is three and so on. So we infer here that automatic prevention detection and uh, correction techniques are lacking on a real-time operating system. When we try to plot these things uh, uh, against, uh, uh, against them, we, what we realize is preventive control forms the most important line of defense for a real-time operating system. Preventive control is inversely proportional to the risk. Generalization maximizes the risk and minimizes preventive control. So if we uh, uh, specialize, if we give special permissions to the file, specialization optimizes the risk and maximizes the preventive control. Therefore, specialization is always better uh, for preventive control. As uh, the preventive control increases, we see the risk decreases. So I'd like to conclude here with the, uh, the observation that primary aim uh, is to design, develop, and optimization security model for operating system managed resources. The risk assessment uh, to optimize operating system resources and its cost. Improve the access control mechanism pattern for better resource production. Improve the composite access control mechanism patterns. Improve the quality of service for hardware, software, and operating system. Improve operational and service efficiency. And better risk assessment for present and future business forecasting and business decision, which will help organization and uh, the management skill. These are some of the book references and other detailed references are available in the paper, uh, which have been used to write. Uh, thank you. That's all what I had. Uh, I tried to stick to my time. Oh. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for your wonderful presentation.